Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, January 22nd, 2023. <clears throat> this is Deacon Barry Taylor and I will be your presenter uh, today. Uh, we are still in Unit 2 of the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, which is entitled God's Promises. We're in Lesson 8. And the title of today's lesson is Living Right Over Empty Rituals. That's a contrast, living, living right as opposed to empty rituals. Devotional reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 11 to 20. Background scripture, Ephesians, I'm sorry, uh, Isaiah chapter 58 verses 1 to 14. And our printed passage or lesson text is Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 10. Our key verse from the King James Version is Isaiah 58 and verse 10. If thou draw out thy soul to, hungry, to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. Our lesson aims are number one, summarize Isaiah 58 to determine the actions that God wants his people to take. Number two, repent of ways and times when you have offered false rituals and prayers to God. And then number three, enact God's justice and mercy as an affirmation of God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Now after the uh, introduction, the lesson has two divisions. The first is entitled So As Stated, that's So, S-O-W, As Stated, that's covered between chapter 58 verses 6 and 7. And the second division is entitled Reap and Rewards, and that's covered between Isaiah 58 8 and 10. Uh, from the standard commentary, the lesson title is God's Promises. God's Promises. Or rather, God Promises Light. God Promises Light. Additional aims from the standard are number one, identify what results in light breaking forth. Number two, Explain the context of the three undesirable actions of Isaiah 58, uh, verse 9b, and number three, propose a way to honor Isaiah 58, 10a, personally today. Now, uh, in the way of uh, a little background, uh, matter of fact, let's go before the throne before we get into a little background on this segment of Isaiah. Our Father, we do thank and praise you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, what you're doing, what you've yet promised to do. We thank you always for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. Lord, we ask uh, as we uh, embark on the study of uh, your word, Lord, that you would give us a clear understanding, Lord, of what you intend for us to understand in your word, Lord, how you intend for our worship and all of our uh, religious -like activities, Lord, to reflect the, the, the true and uh, sincere uh, aims of our heart, Lord, to do that which is pleasing in your sight. Lord, we know that uh, uh, sometimes we get swept up in church activities, and we may think, Lord, that there's some merit in them in and of themselves, Lord, but help us to understand what true worship is for you, Lord, and how you desire that we serve others, Lord, uh, uh, as <coughs> and, and in so doing, Lord, do those things to you, Lord Jesus, as you've said in your word. We thank you, Lord, again, for uh, the privilege to study your word. We pray that, again, as we study it, we will understand it uh, and our, we will put it into practice. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now for those of you who are familiar with <coughs> The prophet Isaiah, or the book of Isaiah, uh, 
you know that there are three major divisions. Uh, the first is uh, <clears throat> one concerning judgment where Isaiah or God through Isaiah pronounces judgment on Israel and others that's covered between chapters 1 and 35 verse 10 the second major division is historical interlude and that's covered between chapters 36 and 39 8 36 1 and 39 8 uh, and that's and then the third is the one that our lesson text is taken from which concerns God's salvation uh, and that's covered between verse uh, chapter 40 verse 1 and the end of the book uh, chapter 66 verse 24 and in this section uh, this division if you will of Isaiah uh, he dis he discusses the deliverance uh, from captivity this is the Babylonian captivity now he foretells this the suffering uh, of the servant of the Lord that servant we know uh, being the Lord Jesus uh, and then the future glory of God's people uh, that's covered between um, chapter 58 verse 1 through 66 24 so our lesson is taken from that uh, third a division if you will from the third a third section if you will of the third division of the book of Isaiah now um, <clears throat> so and and uh, one of the commentators uh, I think uh, made some interesting remarks in the introduction uh, in talking about um, how people are so eager to impress others and appear to have some prestige that they they buy knockoffs designer watches and clothes and purses and shoes that are not the originals because they're too expensive for them uh, but they're knockoffs and they do this again to impress uh, people and to give uh, some appearance that they are or have more than they than they than they do uh, and he says at the conclusion of the introduction that people may be fooled and God may not judge you for wearing counterfeit Gucci watch, a counterfeit Gucci watch or channel Chanel scarf but when it comes to worship only one thing is acceptable the real thing the real thing and that kind of summarizes where we're going in this lesson uh, God is going to uh, chastise if you will uh, Israel for uh, for vain for the vanity in their worship for them going through the motions for the hypocrisy uh, that they're exhibiting and he is going to teach them or remind them of what true sincere worship is uh, and, it, and it begins with uh, fasting he's going to uh, basically repeat what they are saying that they're going through the motions they're fasting and they're doing this and that and it doesn't appear that God is taking notice of what they're doing and very often uh, I think even today uh, we think that God uh, should be taking notice of what we're doing and giving us some credit for that At Sunday school attendance church attendance you know I think some may tend to think that God has a grade book and he's checking off uh, your attendance to Bible study and and regular church attendance and so forth and so we lose um, a sight of the fact that we're not worshiping in spirit and in truth we're not sincere in our worship we're going through the motions and so the lesson is going to be focusing on bringing uh, Israel back to sincere worship the true uh, purpose of fasting uh, and and how God will reward them uh, once they are uh, worshiping him uh, truly uh, in, from the heart and we're going to read uh, more uh, about how he is going to bless those who turn from their vain practices to worshiping uh, truly from the heart uh, is summarized in verse 10 Isaiah 58 10 he says if thou draw 
out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul then shall thy light rise from obscurity and thy darkness as the noonday from the NIV it reads a little <clears throat> a little clearer from the NIV which reads and if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday okay we're going to have some more to say about that verse when we get through it but we're going to look at each division of the quarterly uh, we'll read uh, each passage and then we'll back up and we'll have some verse by verse discussion but before we read the first division the the, the, the passage uh, <clears throat> excuse me covered by the first division so as stated uh, I'd like to read the last few sentences of the uh, biblical context from the quarterly and it says it talks about the divisions of uh, Isaiah as I mentioned but then it says specifically chapter 58 emphasizes God's displeasure in empty religious rituals that do not proceed from a sincere obedient heart God refocuses Israel towards the fundamentals of true worship and outlined the purpose and outcomes of an acceptable fast okay so that's what that's a summary of what chapter 58 is all about and we're just going to take a small section of 58 from verses 6 to 10 and that passage again under the first division heading I'm going to read from the NIV it says is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of the injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke verse 7 is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide for the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood now it's a little hard in starting at verse 6 of a chapter uh, without really uh, contextualizing uh, what you're going to read from that verse on and for the first uh, four or five verses basically deal with uh, the people crying aloud uh, in fact let me let me just read them if you will very quickly from the New King James Version it says cry aloud spare not lift up your voice like a trumpet tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins this is God talking to Isaiah yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinances of their God they ask of me the ordinances of justice they take delight in approaching God why have we fasted they say and you have not seen why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice in fact in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers this is God again speaking re re responding to the people verse 4 indeed your fast for you fast rather for strife and debate and you strike with the fist of wickedness you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high that is by me God is saying verse 5 is it a fast that you have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes would you call this a fast an acceptable day of the Lord so that those are the verses that precede our lesson text the people are complaining that they're going through the ritual they're going through the motions God doesn't seem to be noticing and and I assume they re they realize that because he's not blessing them as a result of the uh, again this hypocritical or the vain fasting and 
and other religious activities that they're doing. They're doing uh, just the contrary uh, to what God truly wants them to do while they're feigning uh, piety. So let's back up to verse 6. Uh, we're going to break this down into uh, different parts. Uh, verse 6a says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Well, let's, let's talk very briefly about what the purpose of a fast is. Uh, the essence of fasting is self-denial. The intent behind the practice is typically understood as being reminded of complete dependence on the Lord, as Jesus expressed in his temptation. We can read that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. And it was not uncommon for uh, Israelites to do community fasting. That was a solemn event that the Israelites practiced. Uh, one scriptural reference is 1 Samuel 7, 6. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously fasting could uh, be an appropriate personal condition for a dedicated time of prayer. And we read throughout the Old Testament when, when Jesus speaks of fasting and what others, it's always accompanied by prayer. So we don't just afflict ourselves by denying ourselves food and drink but we it should be accompanied by prayer and the Lord is going to to let the Israelites know other things that this fasting true fasting should be accompanied by but unfortunately fasting could easily become an empty ritual uh, and uh, that is what has happened uh, they are trying to demonstrate their piety uh, and uh, I'm gonna just flip over really quickly to an example that Jesus gave in uh, Matthew chapter 6 uh, verses 16 to 18. Jesus says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but your Father who is in secret, in a secret place, I'm sorry, let me back up, uh, the verse 18 reads, so that you do not appear to be, to appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So they are fasting uh, to be seen of men and to be praised for their piety or their religiosity uh, and not God, which is hypocritical. And that is what God is going to be uh, focusing on uh, their hypocrisy in their fasting. Now, so God, in that first part A of verse 6, he says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? From the NIV it reads, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? And then he goes on. He is about to explain. He's speaking about something. He's referring to something he's about to say, not something that has been said already. So part B says, to loose the bands of the wicked and the, um, from the NIV to, ha to loose the chains of injustice. Okay, now, uh, so, the, so the chains obviously uh, refer to uh, things that bind, things that bind and they are being bound by wickedness wickedness and and we know uh, that's a broad category there were many ways that they were being wicked uh, namely uh, one of which was idolatry and that was they were giving credit to idols uh, for things that god had done that god alone had done uh, and as you know that was a uh a community it was a, a national sin that was practiced until God carried them away to Babylon part C says 
to unburden the heavy load um, from the from the NIV it says untie the cords of the yoke now we know what a, a yoke is a yoke is is useful in uh, in connecting uh, or tying together a team of oxen uh, so that they can work together in harmony and combine their strength uh, but it is also a restraint and symbolizes a great burden uh, for humans wickedness was a great burden for the people of Israel uh, and they were yoked to it now we're going to talk about a way they can be freed from this yoke, from this restraint, from this heavy burden, which was wickedness. Part C says to undo the heavy burden. Again, this heavy burden is the uh, the burden of sin, uh, uh, legalistic uh, adherence to uh, the law without uh, fulfilling the intent of the law and not showing justice and mercy these are the things that god is going to criticize israel for and he's actually going to give the remedy for un releasing them from this yoke from this burden from this heavy burden and finally <laughs> word e of uh, verse 6 says and that ye break every yoke again yoke symbolizes um this heavy burden and he is speaking of every uh, thing that constrains that burdens them that oppresses them that compels uh, them to uh, act in sinful and insincere ways um, and the and the expression of breaking the yoke um, is metaphor it's, it's a metaphor of making it unuseful to oppress again in the future so to break the yoke to take it off is one thing but to break it is to make it unuseful uh, in the future let's move on to verse 7 verse 7 reads and I'll read from the uh, King James Version is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh let me reread that from the niv and it reads is it not to share now he is going forward and explaining what true fasting is is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood so let's look, look at part a and i've got to go back and forth from the niv and the king james i'm sorry but the follow one commentator um, uh, i need to use the kjv part a says is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry uh, that thou bring the poor that are cast out of their houses out of their house when thou seest the naked thou covereth him so what is he saying here he, he is basically saying that it when you uh, when you see uh, someone that is hungry to share your food when you see a stranger or a wanderer, which is referred to in the NIV, to provide shelter for them. When you see someone in need of clothing, to provide clothing. And we know that Jesus took this uh, a step further in Matthew 25, uh, verses 31 to 46. We won't go there, but you all are familiar with the, uh, the Good Samaritan. Uh, I'm sorry that's and that's covered in Luke 10 verses 25 to 37 where uh, Jesus was being questioned by a lawyer and he says which is the great commandment and Jesus told him 
love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then the lawyer went on to, uh, to tempt him and said, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus gave this parable of the Good Samaritan, where a Samaritan who was disdained, the Samaritan people were disdained by the Jewish people, uh, was the only one uh, to help one who had been beaten and robbed. And uh, he went uh, uh, to extreme measures to, to help uh, get this man uh, healed and back on his feet. Um, let's go on. Part B says, And thou uh, that hideth not thyself from thine own flesh and blood. Again, the NIV is talking about, this is talking about, I should say, um, your, your own kinfolk. I mean, they were so callous and so unconcerned uh, about the welfare of others that uh, it even extended to their own kinfolk. Now, most of us, if we can't expect uh, any help from uh, anyone else, uh, strangers or the government or anyone else, we can usually expect to get some assistance from a kin, some kinfolk. Uh, but in this case, they were so uh, uncaring and callous uh, they de they didn't even care for their own kinfolk, and that really uh, worked a hardship on the widows and the orphan and the foreigners. If they didn't care for their own kinfolk, uh, how were they going to care for those that were not related to them? And and then by the way, um, you know the, the Lord Jesus d does not give them in, uh, any credit for does not give the the Jewish of his day any credit for caring for their kinfolk, you know, or uh, those that uh, uh, they, they loved. He said, don't, don't the, uh, the harlots and the publicans do the same? You know, what thank do you have uh, for caring for your own? So let's move on. Um, we're going to uh, look at now at the second division from the quarterly. Uh, which is entitled Reap and Reward. We just finished the first division. Again, that was entitled So As Stated. And now we're looking at the second Reap and Reward. Now we know the metaphor here is sowing uh, a, uh, a, a, a crop, sowing seed uh, to produce a crop. And this is what God is saying if you do if you fast the right way, if you worship me the right way, if you uh, do these things that he is uh, prescribing here, then you're going to reap a reward. All right, so the second division <clears throat> covers verses 8 to 10. Uh, from the NIV, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard then you will call and the Lord will answer you will cry for help and he will say here I am if you do away with the yoke of oppression with the pointing finger and malicious talk and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Okay, let's back up to verse 8, which reads again, Then your light will break forth like the dawn. Let's start, let's, let's just stick a pin in that. For just a minute we know the light uh, is used throughout the Bible as a metaphor for um, for righteousness for truth uh, for that that dispels uh, darkness and evil uh, and uh, of course uh, there's so many references in the Old Testament and, and new as the how we are to be light how we are to sh uh, let our light so shine that men would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. 
He that follow with me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And God intended for uh, his people to be a light to the nations around him. Uh, and we can see in verse uh, in Exodus, going back to Exodus, when he formed them as a nation, when he brought them out of Israel, uh, chapter 19, verse 6, he wanted them to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation that actually shone as lights to those in darkness around. Uh, I'm reminded of John 3, 320, I believe it is, which says, uh, light has come into the world, but men love darkness. They will not come to the light, lest their deeds be reproved. So we could go on and on about this metaphor, light. And what is God saying, however? He's saying, then, this is part of the reward of looking out for the hungry, for the uh, the naked, for those who need shelter, then your light will will break forth like the morning or like dawn. And he goes on to say, and your healing will quickly appear. Then, and this could this could be uh, certainly spiritual healing, but also physical healing. You know, God is concerned about body, soul, and spirit. So we don't want to just assume that he's talking about spiritual healing here. He's talking about all. You'll be whole. Uh, your healing will quickly appear. He says, then your righteousness will go forth before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Now this is, uh, this is really interesting here. This reference to righteousness is really a reference to God himself. Uh, God himself and is speaking of his military might and it it's it's a reference to um, what he did back in Exodus uh, and there's so we could when when uh, he went before them as a as a cloud uh, uh, by day a pillar of fire by night and you remember in chapter 15 of Exodus when the when the is when the Egyptians were approaching them and they were backed up against the Red Sea, how God went from before them to behind them and was a pillar of fire to separate them from the Egyptian army, from the camp of the Egyptian army. And it was dark on their side of the pillar of fire, it was light on the Israeli side. So uh, he was, he's been, uh, and, he, and, and this pillar of fire, this pillar of a cloud by day and the fire by night followed them throughout their wilderness wanderings. So this is this is a reference to God, him leading them and protecting their rear guard so that they were protected all around. And he's saying you will be protected all around completely. And he talks about the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. He's talking about, again, the protection that he would provide for them again completely let's look at verse 9 <clears throat> then you will call and the Lord will answer you will cry for help and he will say here am I if you do away with the yoke of oppression with the pointing finger and malicious talk now this is a, a conditional promise uh, God is making uh, he is saying if you do this then I'll do that if then in this promise here he's saying um, if you call on the Lord obviously in in in, in sincerity uh, having forsaken uh, your wickedness uh, and we know that uh, the children of Israel during the, the period of the judges uh, went through several cycles when they forsook the Lord uh, they went whoring after other gods, serving idols, uh, and then God oppressed them. He used one of the uh, surrounding nations to oppress them uh, to the point where they cried out to the Lord in sincere, in sincere repentance. Okay, and then God heard them and he delivered them. He sent them a deliverer. We know that's, that cycle was repeated, I believe, some 13 times. Uh, and uh, before they actually uh, uh, called the, the, the first king before Samuel, uh, before Samuel's day. Now, now we we, we know sometimes uh, we, we we cry out to the Lord for things that we we need uh, or we 
I think at least that we we need and 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 we don't uh, we don't always know what God's timing is going to be, and it seems like maybe God is delaying in providing whatever it is that that we need. Uh, we know that Job experienced uh, a long period of of suffering, uh, and and thought that uh, that 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 was due to God's absence, that God was not uh, paying attention to them. We know, having read Job and knowing what was going on, that God knew what was going on throughout Job's trials, and he knows what's going on throughout our trials. We have to remember that God's timing is not ours. God hears us when we call, and God will answer appropriately. He will answer with whatever we're petitioning or calling out to him for immediately, he will uh, answer, no, it isn't something that you need, or he will answer, wait. And we want to, in those instances when uh, he doesn't answer one way or the other, we know that he wants us to wait. Uh, in, in an affirmative or negative, we know he wants us to simply wait on his timing. And we have to trust that God's timing is always perfect, regardless of what we think. So he says he will answer. He said, when you cry for help, he will say, I am here. In other words, he is present with us. Uh, you know, the Lord, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, how he encouraged Joshua in uh, Joshua 1, uh, verse 9. And, and, and throughout that first chapter, he says, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. He said, be strong and very courageous. And he said, uh, and he said, he, he actually tells him, he said, he gives him the reason for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thy, thou goest. Now we Lord, we know that the ultimate manifestation of God being with us is Emmanuel. That's the Lord Jesus, him actually coming in the flesh to be with us. But God is promising his people that when they call out to him for help, he will be very present with them and will uh, answer, will answer their need. And I said he's going to answer in his own timing. And, and but, but the condition of this is, he says, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, and that is oppressing others, if you do away with oppressing others, uh, with the pointing finger of malicious talk, uh, with with uh, uh, casting people down, with uh, uh, looking down on those who are less fortunate uh, than yourself, uh, and who are taking taking your uh, prosperity or your um, whatever God has blessed you with for granted, uh, being arrogant and and being hypocritical. So uh, he's saying, if you don't do those things, then he would answer their call. He would, if they didn't um, speak these empty words, false words, words of iniquity with evil intent. This is what he's uh, talking about when he says, uh, pointing a finger and malicious talk. This is talk that has an evil intent, and it's an intent to hurt, uh, that would block their prayers. That would block uh, uh, God's response to them uh, if they called him, if they're continuing to practice these evil ways. Now, finally, we're going to look at verse 10, our key verse. And from the NIV, it reads, And if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noon day. Now you notice this is another if then conditional promise. If you do this, then this will happen or I will do this. So what is he saying here? What's the if? He says if you spend yourself what's that mean what's he talking about there well he's returned to the fast this is this is a, a an expression of fasting if you deny yourself is what he's saying here uh, and undertake uh, this type of 
uh, the, 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 the true type of fasting that I'm, that I'm telling you about here, uh, the fasting that God desires. And what is that fasting? That fasting is to, to, to see to the needs of the hungry, to satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Okay, that's, that's, that's what he's saying. If you do these things, I'm going to turn over to uh, 1 John uh, 3 and 17. This, that comes to mind here. And actually, I'm going to back up to 16, <clears throat> which reads, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17, But whosoever hath this world's goods, and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So the if is to not to open their hearts to those who are in need, and not just to be uh, empathetic or sympathetic, but to actually provide for their needs, to help them with their needs. This is what uh, the true fasting that the Lord desires is all about. So what what's the then? So the then is if they do those things, uh, then he says they would have light. They would live. They would have lives of light. Okay, and I, we've talked about what light is a metaphor for. Actually, it dispels uh, darkness. It dispels uh, what what can be. Uh, encompassed in uh, darkness is selfishness, insincere worship, hypocritical fasting, and all manner of sinfulness can be characterized as darkness. So this light actually dispels that. When Jesus said again, I am, uh, the light has come into this world, but men love darkness, the light exposes their sin. They will not come to the light lest their deeds be reproved or exposed so he said then you your lives you will have lives of light we will walk in that light uh, as Jesus said in John 18 12 and to ex not not exaggerate but to further describe the extent of the light that they will have he says and your night will become as noonday now we all know the sun is at its highest at noonday it is bright as bright as, as it's going to be when the sun is out at noon okay uh, so what does he say he's saying that this darkness is going to be completely dispelled there's not going to be a shadow of the darkness that represented your hypocrisy and all manner of evil uh, insincere worship, selfishness, etc. So the darkness will be completely expelled, and that is the then. If you do this, then this will happen, or I will cause this to happen. So, in in in, in conclusion, uh, we want to. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read uh, part of the uh, conclusion from the standard here, uh, and and then we'll have a closing prayer. So he says, Isaiah, and this is referring to fasting today. And uh, I'll admit, I don't fast as often as I should. I'm going to try to do better with that. I'm going to do better with that this year. And combined with fasting, uh, I mean, pray, praying rather, praying. So it, it reads, uh, the conclusion reads, Isaiah pushed Israel to understand that what God deems important is not a temporary willingness to fast from food, but a spiritual health that leads to righteous behavior. So we might ask ourselves two questions. Do I go through ritualistic motions on a regular basis instead of allowing my heart to really be turned toward God during those practices? What fast might I need to undertake to align myself with the type of fasting God desires. So I hope that 
this lesson has given us an understanding of what God intends for us to do as we fast and at all other times, by the way, and not just go through uh, vain, uh, empty uh, rituals that mean nothing to him. Okay, just for show or just to satisfy ourselves that we're somehow being righteous and God is seeing and God is giving us some credit for having fasted. Again, I hope that, uh, again, we've learned a little more about God's desire, his, his desire for our, pat, our fasting. So, Father, we do thank and praise you for, again, this time uh, in your word. And we thank you for the understanding, such understanding that you've given us. We pray now, Lord, that you'd help us to put it to practice, Lord. You'd help us to do those things, Lord, which we know are your desires. Uh, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to be more purposeful, Lord, in our uh, helping, Lord, those who are in need, those who are less fortunate than we are, Lord. We ask for your, um, and, and as we do, Lord, uh, help us to do it not looking for a reward from you, but to do it because of your love for us, Lord. And, and help us to reflect all praise, Lord, for whatever we do to you. Let us Help us to let our light so shine that men would see our good works and glorify our Father, you, Father, who are in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.